starring John and Danny. Bam. Who needs fancy transitions or moving curtains? Not this guy, that's for sure. Anyway, welcome to Grim After Dark. My name is John, and this is the Frontline Gaming Network's weekly interview show where we hit the high points of the last week in the Warhammer community, talk to the best players and content creators from around the world about the one thing we all love, uh, Warhammer. So this week, Zach Becker from the LGT is here to talk about the event that's been built up to be one of the biggest events in the UK, uh, what it has in store for 2022, and the UK gaming scene as a whole. Uh, so that's going to be pretty exciting uh, because it's outside of America. So one, thanks for you know being in a different time zone, and two, thanks for making these giant tournaments there. My co-host today needs some introduction. He is the terror of the mid tables, an aspiring overlord, and someone who definitely doesn't want to know that LVO is only thirty two days away. Is Danny McDavid? Hey, John. Hey, how's it going this week? It's going pretty good this week. I, I got really? absolutely zero prep done for LVO, so I'm still as panicked as last week, but that's Solid. okay. Well, we're in good company then. Yeah, we're going to just procrastinate the pounds away. That's our pain Absolutely. challenge. Absolutely. Yep. Um, but in great news, Danny, Space Elves and Chaos Space Marines are coming, and Chaos Space Marines are getting an amazing oh. plastic warp smith. Um, however, the internet was quick to point out the similarities I had with another model, where it kind of looks like a tech marine. Now, Danny, what, what's your thoughts on this? What are your thoughts on... The chaos version of a tech marine looking like a tech marine. Come on, really? <laughs> Is this the kind of are these the kind of things that we're complaining about now? Like that, like oh no, it looks like what it's supposed to look like, sort of, but different. Give me a break. Like not supposed to be a dark mirror of that model, Danny. Only no. new models. Only new models, John, with no previous influence whatsoever. No. Only unique content. Just it was ripped off from Dune. That's all I know. Anyway, um, it <laughs> led me down true. another rabbit hole uh, where I discovered this. Uh, this picture here. Uh, this Chaos Space Marine is actually just a regular Space Marine, except it has spikes. Uh, and that is disgusting. So this rabbit hole goes a long, long way. So are you saying that there's no unique models and just Chaos is a complete copy of, of the Imperium? You have like tactical space marines, and then you have chaos space marines. The only real difference is the the word chaos. I ne I never caught on, John. It's amazing. It's it's, it's incredible. Yeah. I've, yeah, I've, same pose, same armor, just some spikes. Who, who would have thought? Um, I would also like to remind people of this Warhammer meme at this time here. Here, uh, war gamers only hate two things: change and the way things are right now. Uh, so very excited and very appropriate for both uh, Chaos and Eldari players. Uh, next up, this is a conversion I found on Facebook. Uh, this Dreadnought here, uh, while I'm a fan of seeing inside the sarcophagus, there's something no. deeply disturbing about seeing your grandfather wired in there. Uh, Danny, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, uh, I'm assuming venerable Dread, if you got like a sunroof. Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty sure it's Danny DeVito inside of there, actually. I thought I, I could have sworn they modeled it, him to look like that. The nice thing about that for him, though, is that he didn't have to get a custom suit of power armor. They were able to just wire his deformed body directly <laughs> into a dreadnought instead of, you know, him having to get hurt. Like, because Maybe. his stunted torso fit inside of it so well. <laughs> so you're saying there's not actually a dreadnought. It's just a miniature man and a puppet. We got ourselves like an R2-D2 situation. Yeah, going totally. On yes. Yeah. Precisely. No, thank you. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> well, what was it? Um, awful taste, but great execution. Because I, I did enjoy the conversion and the paint job. It's just the... No, the, the paint DeVito's. flesh creeped me out. Like, that was yeah. weird. Yeah, it's very bright in the center. That, that's okay. Uh, moving on. Uh, Tabletop Inquirer is back with more embarrassingly accurate fire today. Um, third edition starter box is being re-released uh, for a limited time, and we're also reminded of the terror of the game store. Um, as uh, it says here, third edition starter box re-released, just not the same without Red Shirt desperately trying to sell it to you every time you stop in for paint. Uh, Denny, what was your experience of third edition coming out? Because I know you've been around a while. Um, did you under get the Red Shirt push at all? Or Well, where I live, John, in Alaska, we didn't really have Games Workshop stores, so no. No, well, that's Sorry. a shame. I was... I was in Aberdeen in the, in the northeast of Scotland as a young mm -hmm. boy going in to buy the pot of paint I'd saved up for three weeks for and some Bretonian spearmen. Uh, and of course, it was just the, hey, you should uh, also buy this Warhammer 40k box. I'm like, oh, I have my Bretonians. I'm like, no, buy this Warhammer 40k box. It was it was real. 
Uh, but I also kind of miss it because I too now am where you grew up in Alaska, where we don't have any of that fun anymore. We just have apathetic stores sometimes. Right. Um, <laughs> which is its own kind of unique charm. Oh, man. Um, finally that- tonight. No, well, you would hope so. I mean, yeah. we're going to put a positive spin on it. We are yeah. sales. Yeah, there you go. Um, finally tonight, this tweet asks us a dangerous proposition. Um Pay me like one of your Warhammer miniatures, uh, this person says on Twitter, uh, which would lead me to believe that they want to be left untouched in a corner for years because at the time they seemed like a good deal, but you just never got around to it. John, let me tell you, I pay my Warhammer miniatures thick. I don't thin my paints. I don't use a lot of water, so it's really thick. <laughs> just so, so yeah, you finish your miniatures as lazily and quickly as possible. Right. Uh, th- th- Three color minimum is a term my wife is going to hate me using, but we're, we're going to move there. <laughs> Finally tonight. Oh, oh, no. This is obviously just the perfect transition over here. Uh, guys, Cherokee Open is February the 25th through the 27th in the Cherokee <laughs> Reservation in the town of Cherokee. Just a few oh miles God, from Great Smoky Mountain National Park. Uh, attached to the convention center, there is an entertainment center with a bowling alley, arcade, and multiple bars to drop the wives, girlfriends, and significant others off at while you go lose two rounds of 40k in a five round event. Uh, get discounted rooms by booking as part of the frontline gaming room block. This will be the 40k championship event and one of the largest events to kick off the new ITC season following the LVO in January. Uh, get your tickets uh, tomorrow. You're kind of busy right now, yeah. John. It's three color, it's three card ante. <laughs> three, three color anti. Yeah, no, no, you were thinking of something different. <laughs> oh, yeah. I see. Yeah, yeah. I got two of the colors there anyway. Yeah. Uh, Danny, why don't you introduce our guest? Uh, so tonight we have on uh, Zach Becker. Zach Becker runs the uh, LGT and also the website lgtpresents.com where you can find out more about the events that he runs. Um, and he's, I think he's got another website he's going to tell us about too. So welcome tonight, Zach. eventually hey there you are (laughs) all right guys thanks for having me on absolutely no problem so yeah yeah, you are kind of what would you feel you are most known for in the uk scene and would that be lgt or would that be other stuff that you guys um well probably unfortunately for polystyrene terrain but um (laughs) aside from that (laughs) oh am i so happy that you were the one who brought that up because that was either going to be a great question later on or a really awkward silence it's um Um, it's actually a good question because as part of this sort of growth in, uh, in the UK scene that we've been leading over the last 12 months, we've had quite a large number of first-time tournament attendees come to our events. Um, so what I'm best known for through them is our new endeavor, which is the UKTC on WarhammerTournaments.com. So it's basically like a catch-all brand for all our events. So um, it's great to see that. However, probably the majority of the broader community know me better for the LGT. It's obviously been around for five years now. So yeah, it's great to see some growth and some new faces, but the LGT is still our headline event and probably what I'm best known for. Yeah, for sure. So the, as, as you kind of alluded to there, there were some kind of growing pains those first few years. Um, and where you had this kind of like this really grandiose idea of having these huge scale events in the UK, because for one, you have the player base to support that you were able to get the kind of the room to support mm-hmm. that. Um, but year one, there was a couple of little hiccups along the way that kind of really scuppered a couple or sorry, year two, I think it was right where there was a couple of the hiccups that kind of scuppered the things there. Interesting. Um, it's been the most talked about thing, obviously, internationally, but the people that were actually there at the time sort of moved past it and it's become a pseudo meme almost you know where the meme has become more famous than the actual thing itself um <laughs> sure so um yeah there were growing pains we messed up a bunch um the terrain was the most noticeable of that because you can capture it in a picture but there were some other issues that we've been trying to fix over the last few years as well obviously came back in 2019 um Ask anyone that came up. That most most people said that's the best one we've ever done, and 2020 was obviously a COVID year. Yeah. But the last one we just did was great. Everything seemed to go well. Uh, still working on trying to get the food nailed down, so that's going to be our big push this year is making sure we have a food offering to match the gaming offering. The gaming side of things is pretty much nailed down now. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so it's exciting stuff. 
Um, it's hard to mess up the running a tournament when you're running like a super major every month, which is what we've been doing since the LGT this year. So uh, we've yeah. got some good practice in that. So, so awesome. what would you say that your largest roadblock that you encountered was and how were you best able to overcome that? Like from, from the last iteration, like that you, that you had, that you were able to say, okay, like this is definitely a problem we had. How, how do we move forward and like make the event even better than it was the, the, the last year? Yeah. So the, the biggest issue you have is, um, it's basically, um, when you work with a new venue, they can't mm-hmm. have all the, the leverage in terms of the legal leverage. So to put this, to make the clearest example, if they cancel on you a day before the event, all yet they have to do is return your deposit. If you cancel them the day before the yeah. event, you lose free money. So that's a microcosm of the broader issue, which is um, while they want to keep you happy, it's not they don't have much consequences if they don't. So when you're working with a new venue and things start to go wrong, you, you only have once a year the chance to learn from it. So if you then don't mm-hmm. want to repeat it with them the following year, you change venues again, and then you have to go through the same with the ground pain. So right. until you find a venue that really clicks, you have to basically just go through these iterations. And the problem is, is when you're growing rapidly, you need to find a new venue anyway just to accommodate the additional space. So that was the problem we had over and over and over again. And now we're running all these new events around the country. It's something I'm sure the frontline gaming guys are dealing with as well. As we're going to a new venue every month now. So, mm-hmm. uh, like I said, the tournament side of things is the easy part. It's all the, the little bits around the tournament that have the potential to go wrong because they're slightly different everywhere you go to. So would you classify that as like a lack of consistency on the part of venues then as being like that major issue? Yeah. yeah. yeah of course, yeah. the venues we use are everyone works differently right so mm-hmm. imagine you know you're just talking about the Cherokee open so that's going to work very differently commercially than a massive casino on the strip in vegas and right. some mm-hmm. of our events you know we've got uh the london one is obviously in a venue fits three thousand people it's a stadium um leicester is another arena so it's again a commercial venue specifically geared towards large-scale events mm-hmm. um but nottingham we have in january it's even though it's four hundred odd player super major, it's not a full time venue. It, it spends most of its time as a school sporting facility, oh. and, mm-hmm. and they sell venue spaces like a an extra thing. Sure. So venues like that, they're not really geared up to offer the same sort of service as a full time professional venue is. So you have to get you have to treat them differently because they don't have the same expectations from you. They don't have the same like. Uh, level of rigor in terms of their processes so mm-hmm. um yeah and obviously the more events you run the more different quirks in these relationships you find um so yeah that's the thing we're, we're struggling with this year but we're not struggling but it's the, the thing we're working most on this year now correct me if i'm wrong about this and i'm wrong about a lot just to kind of preamble um the the issue with the terrain did lead to a really awesome thing where you now actually have like an official terrain set for your events that's produced by a company yeah, so um, uh, I don't want to say official because we, we're not actually commercially tied with them in relation to the product. Um, sure. So TT Combat, who are the, I think the largest MDF terrain producer in the world, um, they do everything. They've got a second-hand store. They've got a Magic the Gatherings card business. They've got a brewery. They're a, a very interesting and, and great company. Uh-huh. Um, they approached us afterwards. Obviously, it was the big news story of that weekend when it happened, what, four years ago now? Mm-hmm. Um, and basically, just offered to help us solve the problem. And that was one of the causes of the problem was that we were trying to customize, we were trying to build all the terrain so it was standardized to our like tournament requirements. We wanted certain size, line side blockers in certain positions. We wanted, you know, technical requirements from how the terrain would function in game. And you can't just go to Games Workshop and buy an Aquila landing pad or whatever and say it's a ruin. It doesn't work that way. So um, they approached us and were like, we'll build you whatever you want. Just tell us how it needs to play in the game and the, the, the dimensions and they'll sort it out. So they did that for us. Um, and then obviously because the, we ordered 400 sets of it, uh, one or then, two yeah exactly um, we've got a good deal on that commercially and then obviously they make a ton of money because everyone that comes wants to get a set for their house or their gaming club or whatever to practice on so it's something we really like um, is that 
you know, you can play, you can go to a gaming store that is in a village of 50 people and has two people you play against on Wednesday, um, but you can still play a legitimate practice game for the LGT on the other side of the world if you want. So. Mm-hmm. No, for sure. Um, you were talking about the kind of going to, to monthly super majors and then kind of doing that over the last year there. Um, aside from kind of like the differences between venues and management that you're working with there, what's been kind of your biggest learning and takeaway from going to from running kind of one super major to like an entire calendar year's worth all over the country? That's a really good question. Um, for me, the... the the most interesting part of this from a sort of corporate strategy point of view is how do you um, differentiate each event and simultaneously standardize it? So it sounds like an oxymoron, but one of the things we're trying to do is create a standardized format in terms of how the events are run. So how registration processes work, mm-hmm. um, people don't have to keep asking when the rules cut of those. It's always X number of days before the event. It's, when's this submission? It's always the Sunday before the event, all of that sort of stuff. Um, now the problem is, is then you end up with just lots of events that feel very similar and the difference is, well, this one's in Nottingham, the last one's in Leicester, et cetera, et cetera. So mm-hmm. trying to come up with in a way that makes these events different, but still fits that broader strategy of trying to make them accessible to new players because they know that whether they go to one in Newcastle or Leicester, it's still going to be the same. So it's one of the things that ITC really did well with back when they were doing their own missions was... If you knew, were going to back to see an event, you didn't have to really read the rules back. You knew what game system you were playing. And back then, that was the exception rather than the rule, right? Because we had mm-hmm. games being played five different ways around the world. So For sure. um, we're trying to do the same thing. And now everyone basically plays the GW mission. So that's fixed one set of problems. But we're trying to do the same thing with the other sort of logistical, the player logistical stuff um, as well. Um, so that's my biggest takeaway so far. Um, mm-hmm. very, you know, aside from the LGT that was in September, we've run Coventry, which was 300 odd players, and Leicester, which was 400 odd, and we've got Nottingham coming up next month. So we're still at the beginning of this phase, um, and I think really lots of the things I'm thinking about and putting plans in place for, they're going to come into effect probably from the next season of events. So the ones that are successful will be repeated, and the ones that are less successful drop off the calendar and then we'll have a sort of more formalized, okay, here are the six or 10 events we're going to be running every year. This is how each one is going to be the same. And this is how each one's going to be slightly different. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if you're looking at the past few months, the, the community online at least has been extremely vocal about sort of the state of the game um, with chapter proof coming out and really not changing much at all to some armies coming out where we had kind of like the orc buggy, buggy spam and and these lists that were just very powerful kind of just dominating these events how were you seeing your events like attendance be affected or kind of like player morale for some of these games yeah i think <clears throat> those two things are slightly different um but interrelated so attendance wasn't affected that much because we launched all the tickets back in sort of post-covid boom so most of them sold out ages ago. It's only really been the recent events that are still on sale. So um, attendance wasn't affected that much, but dropout rate was slightly higher than average. So for these large super majors, you know, your local gaming store with 30 players probably gets one dropout or no show. Uh, the massive events get much higher percentage. So the LGT is around 20, 25%. Um, Coventry was around 30%. So that, that was at the peak of all the planes. You'll recall there was a... Manichima won that with six all planes and buggies. So the dropout rate was much higher. So that's a direct indicator and good data point that like you know, GW can be monitoring on a weekly basis of the health of the game. So directly, you know, aside from an event right next to Christmas, that tells you exactly what player sentiment is because these mm-hmm. people have spent the money on the tickets already. It's not like they're choosing not to buy tickets, they're choosing to not use something they've already purchased. So it's a really good data point. Um, player morale very similar, but the, the difference with player morale is, and even a large event with, you know, it's take AOPO for example, a thousand people, it's still a very small data set of the overall 40k community. You know, we've got mm-hmm. say 10 to 20,000 active tournament players, we've got say 100 to 200,000 active 40k players. So, this is a tiny data point, 
mm-hmm. in terms of people there, in terms of people that would then engage and be influenced by the outcome, it's much, much higher. So it's sort of a leveraged impact. Um, everyone, you know, 10,000 people saw a video I did of the roll of the first term for the commentary final. Now, only 300 people were there, but 10,000 people were disappointed by the fact that the game was basically over in, in the first term. So um, what we've seen through these these different data points I track, because they relate to the event's success commercially as well as the, the player satisfaction of them, um, is a massive upswing, basically. Is, um, the balanced data slate um, maybe didn't do that much for the state of the game. Dark Elder is still winning everything. I was going to say, no, it made Dark Elder much worse, just slightly different. <laughs> yeah. it did, but what it did is it showed a commitment to changing Games Workshop's uh, orientation towards rules releases and game balance. If it's if it's a sustained um, promise, you know, they said they're going to be doing them regularly. If that promise is, is fulfilled, um, it shows a real commitment for the game getting better continuously and responding to uh, player feedback. <laughs> So I think, excuse me, um, I think, uh, yeah, player sentiment is is no longer going to be like continually declining. If the Mm -hmm. balance Mm has come out when they're supposed to be coming out, you see it more like a wave um, of people being like, well, it's going to be rubbish, but then they can look forward to the next one. And then if there's something else, it's a glitch. Because these things are not, you know, they're not features of the game. They're glitches and, and, and issues in the game. Um, yeah. and the more continually you patch the program, the better it will get. So what we've got now is patches and before we so only have to maybe once a year. When you have like this kind of set date that you're trying to set up, then how do you play into like, uh, these, these balance updates coming out quarterly, but not exactly quarterly. Like we don't have like a day and time that they're coming out in. Yeah. And then how do you make, how do you kind of reconcile that? with also making your event feel relevant because there's certain times when you have like these massive like balance changes that come out and then they're not adopted by a tournament. And it's like, well, who cares about what happened there? Like it, it doesn't matter. That's a dead meta. Yeah. So um, it, it is an interesting one. So you I don't know how long you guys have been active in the tournament scene, but the end of seventh was basically this peak terrible tournament scene. So I was winning events mm-hmm. with 60 Unari Spiders that had 180 actions per turn, basically. Um, we were the last um, large-scale 40k event of 7th edition, and mm-hmm. it was a case kind of joke, because they'd started this whole 8th edition promo, and it was like, well, what's the point of going? And my, my response was, well, the point of going is you're going to be the king of 7th edition, right? You win this tournament, <laughs> you're the best person to have done it. Um, and I think we were the only people managing to hit like a hundred player plus events at that point in the game because it was like, you know, a free for all. Crazy, yeah. Um, so that's like you go to that event right there so you can remember why seventh edition was awful and yeah. make you appreciate <laughs> it more. <laughs> yeah, and the guy that won, I think, had the sort of the twenty seven screamers. Mm. And uh, played his brother who had 45 wolf spiders and two wraith knives or something. Anyway, um, a simpler time. Time. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, is, this has always been an issue and something that we've, you know, I think us and Nova, in terms of where we happen to be in the calendar, just have to deal with these more often than not. The most uh, pertinent version of that problem is the new missions, right? So they're right. coming out at some point, soon ish. We don't know exactly when, but. Um, we're expecting it to be sort of Q1. And uh, we have a, a super major, in, like end of Jan. Mm-hmm. So how are we going to time our rules cutoffs such that you know we can use the missions that are most representative of the game and the points, et cetera, et cetera. Now, LVO just said we're not using them, which is one end of the spectrum in terms of letting people practice and knowing what event they're attending to. Um, were we talking about the LGT, I might be more inclined to say, yeah, okay, we're going to extend those and have a similar sort of policy of a month out to make sure that this event is the calendar highlight of that previous 12 months. So what John did and what the guys at Frontline Gaming are doing in terms of trying to make sure that this is the crowning event of that mm-hmm. period, it's something I can empathize with. And I think it's one 
end of a perspective that's valid, but not necessarily appropriate for all events. So even though the Nottingham Super Major is 400 odd people, it's still not our biggest event. It's still sure. our mid. It's like our mid-season event mm -hmm. um, because our UKTC runs uh, through like LGT to LGT, so through to September, and. Um, We've basically just tried, we tried to basically extend the rules cutoffs and basically implement two separate policies. One that's like mm -hmm. if a codex drops or if a white dwarf comes out with a new formation mm -hmm. or something, you got one set of dates. And then the other two things that are slightly more relevant because they're new people to practice for longer um, or they're just a little more fundamentally are the balanced data slates and the new missions and obviously the points come with the new missions. So. We've effectively got two sets of rules cutoffs. Okay. Um, slightly staggered. What's the reaction been by the community? Because obviously, you know, with the UK being sort of like the homeland of Warhammer, um, but without any major tournament scene for kind of super major level events where you have like hundreds and hundreds of players, what's kind of the, the player base reaction been to this kind of expansion that you've shown uh, almost kind of post 2020 in the UK where you have, like I said, these monthly things that you're, you're whittling down. Yeah. Um, it's, it's actually been quite touching. Um, lots of the players that have been semi-active in the scene, um, or new ish, like there was just before COVID. So mm -hmm. they have this uh, perspective on what the scene used to be and what it is now. And to, to highlight it, it's basically, it's like, we had gaming store level events. So the largest events in the country were like, how big is the biggest gaming store in the country? It was like 100 players, right? Um, and they were Shark Tank events because everyone up went was like the desperate to get a ticket so it would set out all the time. So you'd go there and it'd be like 70 hardcore players used to go and form one. They weren't super accessible for two reasons. One, they would set out super quickly and two, they were really hardcore. So if you're a fresh player and they went, you probably would have the best gaming experience. So people have a memory of that have basically just been so um, warm and, and um, I don't know how to describe it, just multiple, multiple messages of thank you for what you're doing. Um, mm -hmm. Now, what I'm doing is basically a childhood dream of mine, right? So when I was 13, 14, and I was playing in GTs, this is pre adepticon right? So this is before these mega events really existed anywhere. And I was thinking to myself, like, why can't we have bigger events? So we're playing in school halls and church halls. It's like, why mm -hmm. can't we have this for 10 times bigger? Why is there no, you know, chess already had, you know, not, not really live streams, but massive, massive events, right? Chess, super popular board game. So this was like an aspiration. Now, of course, when I was a 14 year old competitive player, my real aspiration was to win these events, but they don't exist and someone has to create. So I'm sort of doing a second, secondary level of my childhood dream. It's like, create them first, and then maybe when I'm an old man and retired, I can come back and win them. But we'll see what happens. Clint Eastwood, <laughs> the whole thing, yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing I was going to say about kind of the UK scene is the joke has been for like the longest time that the meta is, is I'm, I'm sure I'm going to be correct here in a second, but six months ahead in Europe or like there are these things happening in Europe. Where do you think that perception came from? Uh, and then do you think it's actually true that the UK is ahead meta wise of the game? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, so where did it come from and is it true? I think the, the, where did it come from is um, it comes from the fact that it was true and I'll talk about that in a second. But how, how, it, how it became true is the more interesting point, which is um, it's a structural issue, right? So in the States, if you're Sean Naden and you want to play Joel Lennon, you're going to get in your car for a long time. Um, in England, you're basically only ever two hours away from any other member of the ETC team. And you're only three hours away from Poland, Germany, and all the other countries in, in the EU. So the, the catchment area is just fundamentally um, more densely populated with, um, well, how to describe it, hardcore players who are skilled and are practicing and motivated. Because you can have any one of those things. There's lots of great players in the world that don't have the motivation to maintain that level of performance. Mm -hmm. um, 
Andrew Gonyo comes to mind, right? Absolutely fantastic player. Whereas in the ICC rankings, right, it's not it's not active like he used to be. So um, maybe we'll just start a bit, Danny. Maybe Val too. Like we're in the world as Andrew Gonyo, and we'll just do <laughs> random maps every week. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, well, I'm making the point about Andrew, right? Because um, it links into the second point. So the second point was that with that stereotype always used to be true. And then there was this American resurgence, uh, not resurgence, but emergence in 2018. Um, you guys won um, the LG team, Mike Brown, mm -hmm. um, the LG team Invitational, Jeff, um, and the ETC, of which Gonyo was captaining, which is why I brought him up. So that that sort of meme was true historically, probably, you know, you would say 2016. And then to some extent, um, I think it might be true now. You've seen what happened with, um, like, one UK player goes to two US events and comes second and first in the two he goes to. Um, mm -hmm. now I'm Manny super goes, polite of Richard Siegler not to go to that second event. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but obviously, Manny is a very, you know, he's a professional player, right? So you expect him to do well where, wherever he goes. Um, but, you know, having one player out of 300 go and do that, I think is uh, quite representative of the skill level and say the top 5% of UK players, because, or UK tournament players, I should say. Because Manny mm -hmm. isn't every event he goes to in the UK, like he's, he's still regularly being beaten. Well, Manny um, doesn't win every event he plays in here either. Obviously, <laughs> um, I don't know. We'll see because obviously there's no, there's not been an ETC now in two years, three years. Um, mm -hmm. So that's really different. I don't know. It's hard because you have these two metrics, right? You have the metric of um, how many players are there in the top fifty in the ITC and where do they come from, and then you have the other metric, which is the ETC performance. Um, and I guess there's different sort of structural reasons why you might be good in one and less good in the other. So obviously the States dominates the ITC rankings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, for sure. I was going to say, <laughs> um, you mentioned the ETC, which which is kind of like a different way to play the, the game competitively and is a super popular format over there. Did you have any sort of like issues or feedback uh, when you started running events that there were more similar to kind of US events, maybe with like some cues from ETC for some other things, um, but less of the team format, less of kind of the differential points and kind of more the, the classic just straight missions? Um. Yeah, um, much less so as time has progressed. The thing about the UK scene is uh, the ETC wasn't really dominant here. It was more like the players, <clears throat> the, scene, the events were small enough that say 20% of the players out there would be either in the team or trying to get into the team. And as a result, they, they were motivated to want to play in the format that was represent what they're attempting to qualify for. As events grew, that became much less important um, to the average tournament attendee. And it mm -hmm. can coincide with um, the move to 8th edition. Um, so that sort of like one step change happened. And obviously, the move to ninth was an even bigger one because that's when the ETC said they're using game structure missions as well. So that brought the, um, the two systems more closely aligned. Then the key gap being the VP differential, which is for anyone that doesn't know, is basically um, you don't win based on your VP, but based on the difference between your VP and your opponents. And then you sum those up across the teams, and that creates the overall winner. So it's possible to lose the majority of your team games and still win the round based on how well you win the games you win. Um, why for Just to jump in there real quick, what's the better format? Um, <laughs> depend, look, define better, right? So, um, <laughs> for, for single, you can have different, different best formats depending on different types of events, right? So, if you have um, a format like LVO, so winners play winners, and to win the event, you have to win all your games, and there's enough rounds such that only one person that algorithm comes through with the answer true. So, one person wins all their games throughout the whole of the LVO. Then you have the same format. So you just said this is definitely the best format for the LVO. All right. 
probably agree. When you apply the same format to um, New Orleans, and you end up with players winning the event that have lost games, so clearly it doesn't the same the same algorithm does actually the same outcome. So mm-hmm. one format that we've just said is the best in another circumstance is not the best. So the question really is, what are you trying to achieve with your event, and what are the um, the metrics and, and the different um, influencing factors? So for example, the LGT, we're trying to achieve um, a calendar highlight event for the UK and for players who travel generally. And because of the fundamental constraints we have in the UK around uh, player interest in taking time off work, uh, in yeah. terms of cost of venue, mm-hmm. in terms of these other sort of um, things that you might normally consider to be external to the tournament format, influence whether or not having the LVO format at the LGT is viable. And the fundamental mm-hmm. answer is no. So Coventry was a three-day event with one undefeated winner, same exact same format as LVO, just one less round because it was was it 500 plus players, it was 256. Um, now that, even though it was a large event, you know, still I think it's still the third or fourth biggest event in the ninth edition so far, um, was our least popular format of all our events we've run. So we've come mm-hmm. up with a sort of hybrid format now where we have a, a more UK traditional five round event and then cuts to top four and then we have semifinals and finals for the top four. And that's been the format we've been using for all of the other super majors uh, with the exception of Coventry and with the exception of the 2022 LGD. Um, that's upcoming obviously later next year and we'll be doing the same sort of thing, five rounds and a cut and then we'll go through to four rounds of format so that, uh, to finals. So that will be more akin to the LVO format. The biggest difference being that we're having to cut off to five rounds rather than after six. And that mm-hmm. keeps the overall event, you know, for the 772 people that don't make the finals or whatever the number is, keeps the format more akin to what they're used to, what they would be going to at their normal 32 player event, except now there's 800 people. Yeah, for sure. That makes sense. Uh, yeah. And I'm sorry, Dan, do you have something there? Because no, I, no, I no, keep just continuing cutting you off. That's fine. Oh, man, that's so good. Um, <laughs> so. We already mentioned Manny Chima as being kind of one of the premier UK players kind of coming across, uh, winning one of the GW events over here uh, in the US. With your kind of view of the competitive scene over in the UK, who are some players to really kind of keep an eye out and kind of follow along in the rankings? Yeah, um, the obvious one who's much less well known, but um, arguably is like our version of Richard Siegler, wins every event he does go to, but doesn't go to as many as he could, um, is obviously Malik. Um, Malik won the LGT proper, the LGT Invitational, um, the London Open, which was like a hundred player major we ran, um, came second or something at Coventry as well. So he's sort of like, um, a bit of a savant, uh, in terms of his performance. The biggest issue at the moment we're going to have, um, is UK is obviously going through a bit of a COVID issue at the moment. Um, whether or not we'll be able to get over to the LBO. So I'm fortunate enough to, to be there, but a large number of the top tier UK players, even though they hold tickets, are still undecided about whether they'll be able to make it. Um, so he would have been the guy that I would say, you know, put a strong bet on making the finals. Um, Boris Mitchell made LBO finals in, I guess it was the, the Iron Hands year. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So he got over there, um, and he actually just came second at, Covent, at uh, Leicester, so second at a 400-player event after having played no 40K for basically six months. So he turned up, he had played two practice games beforehand, which he'd lost, <laughs> and then came second. So um, he's always one to watch. Um, and there's a few around. Um, Comrade won the first ever LGT, won the Invitational, against Josh Death in 2019. Um, and I think he also played Mike Grant in, or Jeff in the Invitational Finals um, previous year. So there's a bunch of guys, I'd say there's normally 10 people that can afford to travel that are also in contention to get into the finals. Um, mm-hmm. 
in the Iron Hands year, you also had Alex Petford, who um, is uh, Malik and Comrades, like one of their main training partners. They're all on Dice Downs team, which uh, I believe is second or third in the rankings at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a few people. The problem is, is um, not that they're not performing well, but because the way uh, my events are staggered throughout the calendar year, Mm -hmm. Their ITC points are not really being accrued this year. It's mostly going to be factored into next year. So when you look at the ITC rankings three or four months into next year, I would guess that the top five or top ten, maybe say 30 to 50 percent UK players, primarily because in February we've got um, there's a super major in Bournemouth. Um, I'm running a, a hundred plus player major. We've got another 320 player event. March, I've got a super major. April, we've got two super majors. So by May, you know, you could see Manny, Malik, or any of these other players I've mentioned already with three super major wins on their record and you're only a quarter of the way into the season. So um, I think that's really going to be the biggest tell is, is sort of six, six to nine months into next season. Um, what the ITC rankings look like because they could look fundamentally different to how they've ever looked in the past when the US has had mm -hmm. access to many more of these yeah. large scale events. Um, just so we're going to hear from chat real quick. Uh, I can't believe no one has said Winter's SEO yet. Um, that's the, <laughs> either an off of. Is that even a real person? I don't know. No one has fake names. That doesn't work out right, Val. Um, and then also, uh, conspicuous by his absence, Innis Wilson is not a top player from the UK. Uh, officially True story. Uh, said here uh, by, by Zach Becker. So thank you. Thank you for, for confirming what we already knew. Yeah. Friend of the show, so we can make fun of him. Well, we can, but that's okay. Oh, sure. <laughs> So, uh, how is like the, the the health of the game right now to you? Because we're kind of in this weird midpoint, right? Where we have half the armies have ninth edition codexes, um, like a third have nothing announced, a third have hey, look at this cool stuff that's coming out. Some point, I don't know. Here's a jet bike. Shut up. Uh, what is sort of your take on where the game is right now? Yeah. So, um, I think we have a tendency tournament organizers, tournament commentators and media personalities whose content is driven by tournaments or at least competitive 40k to have a bit of blinders on this where our perception of the health of the game is too tied to how balanced is it in the top tier or top two tiers versus a great average player's experience. So um, a new release of Eldar models, if it's mm -hmm. comprehensive, is going to do much more for the health of the game than a more balanced top 10 that will be over. Um, so many people play that faction, be so happy to, to basically go and spend all their Christmas money. Um, but things like this we often forget. So I think that's an important point to start with. Um, now, to answer your question in a more traditional way, how healthy is the game? Um, if you exclude Dark Elder, I think it's arguably the best it's been since the end of eighth. Um, one of my favorite matchups to play in ninth edition is Sisters v Sisters. It's super dynamic. You have all these cool rules that you can interact with each other on. And Sisters being an army that lends itself to my sort of play style. So I've been practicing armies like that as well as my tournament staple, which is Deathwing, so the complete opposite of Sisters. Um, and both of these armies play in very different ways. Mm -hmm. um, but can compete, and I think that shows a real good, um, good, good marker that you're basically saying the game can be played in multiple different ways depending on your personal preference, and you still are one with a shot. Um, yeah. So I think that Danny, was, Danny, two point. legs doing armies that sit in their deployment zone on an objective, right? Danny, that's, <laughs> that's why you like Deathwing. Who there wants to move into the opponent's <laughs> half of the table. What a waste of time. That's how you save your chess clock time, is you just don't have a movement phase and yeah, you score don't. your secondary points. That, that, that's kind of how it goes. <laughs> um, you've been working kind of under some real, obviously, restrictive conditions in the UK for, for obvious reasons. If you were to plan your dream event with, like, zero, zero, like, no's, what would your dream event be? Um... All right, what would my dream event be? This, is, this has a more practical implication than maybe um, the way the question was intended because 
Um, when we set up the LGT, our goal was to do X, Y, and Z. And we've kind of already done them. So I had a bit of an introspective moment over the last 12 months to be like, okay, well, what, what's, what do I want to do with that event next? So the answer to that question I haven't really come up with. I don't really have an answer to your question as a result. So let me go a bit more off-piste and um, think of something that would be a bit more fun. So I would love to do an all-inclusive um, Cancun tournament. 400 plus players in a five star, three three plus star hotel, unlimited booze, unlimited food, um, play a couple games of 40k and maybe in the afternoon, evenings when it's like less beachy time, people are left hung over. Um, I think that would be super fun. <laughs> Obviously, flights to Cancun are super cheap from all across the States as well as the UK, as well as Europe. Um, I think it's so- really important to point out. Um- the, this Cancun open bar event on the beach should absolutely not be live streamed in any capacity. I'll tell you what, when I, when, I, when I came up with the idea and I was like, oh, you know, how viable is this? Um, one of the places we actually called up is the Hard Rock. There's a couple of Hard Rocks down on the, fly, on the, on the Mexican Riviera. Um, one of them has like a beach front marquee. They're like, yeah, you could probably fit like 200 people under this marquee. Um, so this very nearly became a reality. Unfortunately, it didn't um, for a number of different reasons. But I would love to do something in that vein. Like for me, my sort of my main passions in life are mountaineering, um, travel, and 40k. And it's hard to run a 40k tournament up a mountain, but you can probably run a 40k tournament in many other of these lovely locations. And, um, I heard um, actually I came to. Um, I think it's called the Red Rock GT in Southern Utah. Um, mm-hmm. Absolutely great event. It's a you know moderate sized GT, um, but right next to Zion and and all of the amazing uh, tourist attractions in Southern Utah. And uh, I just thought they were, they, it was so great to to hear from the locals there about these different types of events they had. So um, Lou, the guy that runs it, was telling me that there's a 40k of combined with ski touring uh, event or something it's like a oh, that's different cool. ski chalet up in the mountains and then they play 40k in the evening to ski in the daytime so I thought that was awesome obviously cruise hammer is another example of this combining another activity that people already enjoy with their hobby and by virtue of that with like-minded people and i think this is um a really novel and interesting way to, to create cool events i will say you're saying you like your mountain tiering Kill Team is always a viable option for smaller scale games <laughs> of the side of the mountain. Yeah, um, and also, have you heard of something called extreme ironing, uh, where you just take your ironing board, you iron, and you just iron in extreme locations? I think Extreme 40K has some legs. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just top of a mountain, set up your little Kill Team table, and yeah, then yeah. instantly lose to Admech, turn one. And just, you know, it's perfect. <laughs> yeah. And realistic. Um, yeah. I think- <laughs> I'd make it and they're dominating in two games as well. I'm not a kill team player, so it would be unfortunate if they were great in multiple games. As well. <laughs> For sure. So you said you played Death Wa- uh, Deathwing, sorry, you playing Sisters to kind of get some skill muscles going. What was kind of like your original like favorite army there? Was that still Dark Angels? No, no. I, I'm, um, Good man. I'm, I'm a second edition uh, starter, so my first passion was uh, Orcs and Obviously, despite the direction that everyone trod on in the middle of the night. Um, <laughs> but that was really like, I bought the box. The, you know, we have this, um, you put the meme up earlier about the, G, the red shirt trying to sell you the third edition starter yeah. box set. This is a true story. And I haven't been through Games Workshop ever since. I was <laughs> seven or eight, right? I was a child. And I went into Games Workshop with my mother. And it was my birthday is right before Christmas. So the, the red shirt comes up to me and my mom, and she's like, you know, it's his birthday, I want to get him something. Um, what should we get him? And the red shirt sells my mom on the second edition starter boxer. So she buys one for us, um, for, for me. Um, I was basically playing by myself at the time. And um, I assembled the guys, and about six months later, you know, I saved up some more pocket money, so I went back to the workshop to buy something else for my orcs and blood angels. And I go in, and the red shirt comes up to me, and he's like, gives me the spiel. Of course, by now, the edition has changed, so he's trying to sell me the third edition box set. 
So oh, I was a little eight-year-old kid, and I spent all my birthday money on one thing that's now completely useless, and now he's trying to resell me something else. So um, I, I was a sucker, and I bought the third edition rule book. But I was a regular. Yeah. You know, I was going in there every day as much as I could after school. So I actually learned how to play the game just by playing. I never even read the rule book. So in two Thursday months, nights. my very first two purchases of Games Workshop models was the second edition box set, which was completely useless, and then the third edition <laughs> rule book that I never opened. Um, so damn you, red shirts. Um, but my first my red shirt was, moment, I was sold the, the second edition box set. That was my red shirt moment. But he also sold me add-ons. Um, so he sold me like a, a blister pack of space marines and of course this was back in the day when it was like lead going to white metal so you have like a 10 year old with super glue and and lead. it doesn't work then it falls apart you get quit really easy luckily that second edition box for like the three part marines where it was like bolt gun backpack model perfect yeah yeah, yeah i played um i played corn berserkers um when i finally realized that you shouldn't be buying starter box sets you should be buying the things you actually want um <laughs> So yeah, it's um, you know if Games Workshop's trend of doing the Death Guard and Thousand Sons, you know, continues in the future, I'm sure I'll be a happy hobbyist at some point. Not yet. But right now, your your old Berserkers is still current, and that's a beautiful thing. <laughs> yeah, twenty years old, I think I are now. Something like that. Yeah, more timeless sculpts. Timeless. Yeah, I think it was like mid '90s or something. I think it's about the same age as the Eldar range, which is, uh, as we're saying, getting an update um, as as we're going along. Uh, Zach, tell people where where can they find you? Where where can they follow things? Where do they kind of scope out the UK tournament scene and protect themselves uh, when the sharks <laughs> head on over? Um, so there's there's basically two primary places um, I live on the internet in terms of um, everything I do. The, the primary one um, for the LGT is lgtpresents.co.uk. Um, that's the full website for the LGT pack, all the different LGT events, 40K and otherwise, um, and has its own dedicated web store. So tickets for the LGT will be going on sale there um, 28th of Feb, I think it's oh, of Jan, sorry. So that's the Friday of the LVO. So if you're at LVO, put your dice down in the game, get yourself a ticket. Um, I will literally yell at you across the yeah, yeah. Well, you, you and I'll be there. We'll just yell at hey, you. Get I'll, get I'll walk around shouting uh, during my game. Um, yeah. But I don't have a passport. You have time. Go get it. Buy your LGT ticket. Yeah. Aggressive sales um, tactic. Yeah. So the LGT, that's, um, <clears throat> uh, I think, the 30th of uh, September and then the first weekend of October. So first, second, third of October as well. Um, that's, as I said, all on the LGT website. And then for the broader stuff that we do, um, which is less about this mega calendar highlight type event, and it's more about um, developing uh, the UK scene generally through um, a bunch of different tools. So we have a, a map-based search engine, calendar-based searches that you can do, um, as well as uh, obviously the landing pages for the Nottingham Super Major, the less than all the other Super Majors we run. And that's mm -hmm. uh, warhammer-tournament.com. And that has the UK TC rankings, which effectively are similar to the ITC, but they're only for UK-based events. Um, and that's all there. So we've got these two different places for two different purposes. So if you're interested in the LGT, head over to one. If you're you know more regular in the UK scene, head over to the other. Amazing. Awesome. Danny, anything else here before we wrap it on up? Nope, I'm totally good. Thanks, John. Awesome. Well, Zach, thank, thank you, you so Zach. much for coming on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, super, super great to hear about the UK scene and kind of where it's gone, how it's developing, and how you've developed your events over five years again from one uh, signature event to uh, a whole calendar full. It's super cool and great to see the UK scene in such a great health. Um, Speaking of healthy scenes, next month and starting next week, even in the new year, Grim After Dark, we're starting our LVO month, uh, which we're super excited to bring you. Uh, we have interviews with judges. We have information about the event. We're going to talk to top players uh, and we're going to just have uh, 
even the Falcon is going to come back and talk about LVO. So we're really excited for all of that. Well, most of us are really excited about all of that. Uh, building up to the big event, which is in 32 days. Uh, if you are looking at a gray box of Black Templars, the only thing I can advise you to do is stop streaming and go put some black paint on those things. So for Grim After Dark, I'm John, Danny. Thank you, Zach. Thank you, producer Val, editor Tyler. Uh, we will see you on Monday.